Nom is a parser combinator library for Rust that allows you to build streaming zero copy parsers, while Nom Supreme extends Nom to build a better developer experience on top. I'm gonna to show you quite a few code examples, so if you wanna clone the repo, you can do so here and follow along. So if you take a look at the Nom docs, they have this example here for a hex color parser. I've taken the liberty of pulling that example in to the examples folder inside of the project that we're going to use here. So to see what this does, we can do cargo run example nom, which will run the nom.rs example in the examples folder. Our main function for this example functions a little bit more like a test. So we're doing an assert equal with the hex color parser and a hex color as the input. And we're testing against an okay variant for a result with no input left and a color that has a red, green, and blue component from the hex color. So briefly, the way that nom works is by taking a number of functions, whether there are functions like hex color or hex primary, or built-in functions like tag and tuple, and combining those functions on the input to return different values to us and eat a little bit more of the input. As we move through the parser, this input will get shorter and shorter. So in this case, we have hex color, which is our root parser that takes a string slice, and we look for a hashtag first based on that original input. We're shadowing that input variable, so this input here is slightly less input than the one that we gave to the tag parser. We don't particularly care about the result of the tag parser because it's just going to be a hashtag, so we get rid of it, and then we do the exact same thing with the input and the return value with a tuple parser. So the tuple function takes a tuple of parsers, so hex primary is a parser just like tag is a parser, and we do that three times on the input, we handle the error, so this input at this point should be an empty string, and we should have the three components of a hex code, the red, green, and blue inside of this tuple result, which we can then return in an okay result with the remaining input, which is an empty string for us, and the color struct, which returns our color. There are a whole bunch of different parsers. There are a whole bunch of different things you can do with those parsers, but all of them have the function signature input input type with this I result as the return type. This I result mirrors the input type. So if the input is a string slice, then this is going to be a string slice because it's the input type. And then in this case, we're parsing out a U8. So a hex digit represents a number from zero to 255, which is a U8. And you can see that our color is a red, green, and blue field, all of U8s and so on and so forth. And we've got a little bit of helper functions here and things like that that we're not gonna cover. So broad overview of nom, we have a parser. Those parsers are built up of other functions. Those functions are also parsers. And then we end up with whatever struct we need to at the end. One part of nom we didn't really discuss in that example is this I result type can actually take a custom error. So we have our string slice as the input. We have our U8 as the return type from this hex primary. And we have this new error type called error tree. This is an arbitrary error type. It can be yours, it can be mine, it can be a third party crates. In this case, this error tree comes from the nom supreme crate. By default, if we flip back to our original example, if we don't specify that error as a type argument, what we get is nom's error type. Nom's error type is fairly simple. It takes the remaining input as well as what kind of error occurred. Nom also provides a more verbose error that tracks a whole bunch of errors because we could have a parser that's as deep or as recursive or as alternate as we want. So this verbose error then will keep track of more of those errors and keep more information around. And we can choose to use either one. It's just that nom defaults to the basic error type because it can be costly if you have a high performance parser to collect this extra information. Now, if we look at this, there's a number of traits that you have to implement for any given custom error type that you use. There are things like parse error here or from external error or error convert or context error is another one. Error tree here on the right is an extremely comprehensive error type that is sort of like verbose error plus plus. It keeps even more data. It keeps even more of the alternate branches that you could be parsing. It keeps all more context. It allows you to add more context, things like that. So if we look at the error tree example and we run it, the only change we've made here is we're using the error tree type instead of using nom's error type itself. In our main function, we have the same assert, which I've chosen to unwrap instead of matching on the okay here, not a huge difference. And then we have hex color on a faulty hex code and a hex color on another faulty hex code. And then finally a hex color on a faulty hex code that we've unwrapped so it'll panic. 
If we run this example, the first hex color, hash two, right here, we can see the error comes back with some pretty basic information. You know, it's got the location that the error actually happened at, and then we've got the kind of error. So this is take while MN. If we had access to the source code, for example, we could see there's take while MN right here, and that's kind of where this is erroring out. Similarly, for the hex color for two, three, four, five, six, seven, it doesn't have a hashtag on the front. So this hex color is also an error, and we see the location. This location Location, it's interesting to note is the tail of the rest of the input effectively. So if we have a location with all of the input, that means right at the beginning, there was an error. In this case, it's an error of tag. So we can go back up to our parser and there's this tag parser that looks for the hashtag. Therefore, the error here is that there is no hashtag. So the error tree builds up a bunch of information, but it doesn't seem particularly useful yet, but we can do more. So if we run the error tree tag example and we look at the error output for the tag that we just saw, we see expected tag hashtag. So now we've got a little bit more context about what the tag was looking for. And we can see that we haven't actually changed the hex color parser. So it looks like we almost haven't done anything to our parser to get this extra information. Of course, the truth is that nom supreme has a tag parser and this nom supreme tag parser adds that extra information into the error tree type. So if we look back at our implementation in just the error tree example, we can see that tag comes from nom, whereas in our error tree tag example, the tag comes from nom supreme. So that's how we're getting the extra error information. And the error tree is how we're storing it. But we can go even further than this. If we run the error tree tag context example, we can see that we've got our tag information for the second failure. And then for the first failure, we've got a stack of errors where we have some context and we've got a custom sort of error message here for what happened and what we should have expected. So that's done by this context method on the parser itself. And that's because nom supreme has an extension trait called parser ext that extends the parser trait to add these context functions. And it takes this context and it puts it right where we need it whenever this take while MN fails. So instead of getting a take while MN error kind, we could now theoretically display to our user, you should have given us a two digit hex code. And we can do that right in the hex primary parser, which means that right where we're trying to grab the two digits, we can add that context to what we're trying to do. And then when it fails, we get to use that context later for some more information. But this parser ext extension trait actually goes even further than that. So by far, one of the biggest comments that I get when I use nom on stream or in a YouTube video is that it's kind of verbose, right? So if we look at the parsers here, we can see that you do let input and then the result of the parser with the parser, and then you pass the input to the parser, and then you handle the error with the question mark, and then you do that whole process again for the next parser. And if this parser got pretty big, it would be again and again and again and again. I don't mind this, but some people do. So nom supreme through that extension trait, through parser ext right at the top here, adds a bunch of postfix variants for these combinators. So if we run this error tree tag context postfix example, we don't get anything much different in our errors. So we can see that we haven't made any functional changes, but this parser ext allows us to take these combinators and postfix them together. So let me open this in another tab and just show you the difference. So we've got the same code on the left and the same code on the right. They do the same exact thing. On the left, we're using this let input syntax, doing it over and over again. On the right, we've taken the same code and we've added that context to it. We've post fixed the map res with the same from hex function. And then we use this dot parse to finally parse the input. So if you don't like this way of doing this on the left, nom supreme allows you to post fix all of this together and actually compress your parser is quite a bit, especially if they're simple parsers, especially if they're straightforward. And that brings us to our final example, the final parser. If we run this, we can see that the output has changed a little bit. And that's because I've used the error tree and final parser functions to grab that context that we were looking at earlier and supply a location that we would tell the user it happened at. So we've got our hex color parser, which is kind of like our previous final parser. It's the last one, it's the top level, it's the one that we call. I've added this additional function whose only purpose is to apply this final parser function to that hex color parser. And what this does is it takes the input, it applies the parser, and it allows us to change the return value into a normal Rust result. So you can see that we're not dealing with this I result type anymore. We're now dealing with a regular result that gives us the value that we want in the success case 
and an error tree with a string slice as the input in our error case. And this is important because what happens here is that this error tree is kind of like a new error with the additional generated context. And the reason that that's important is that there are places in our string and there are things that we can't find the locations for while we're parsing. So what this does is it takes the information we have from the parsers and generates a context that tells us exactly where all of those failures actually occurred in the global string or the global input. So to do that, we can use this hex color final on whatever parser we want. I've chosen one that gives us an error. And in this case, I'm just matching on the error. The error tree that we've been using is actually a type alias to the generic error tree. So that's why I'm matching on generic error tree here. It has a variant called stack that has the base that we were looking at earlier. So this base right here, and then the additional contexts from our parser failure. So for each of those contexts, we can regenerate the location or recreate the context of where that failure happened. So in this case, it happened on line one, column two. And this is important because if you have error reporting that you wanna give back to a user, if you're building a CLI, if you're trying to create a good experience for your users, you can use error reporting libraries like Miet to take that location information along with that context and it gives you all of the information that you need to produce this kind of error message where you've got the input right here on line one, you've got this arrow exactly where the parser failed, and then here would be where you put your extra contextual information that you just pulled out of the parser error. And of course, you could create your own error here. It doesn't have to be the generic error tree. It doesn't have to be anything specific. There are traits that you can implement. Error tree is just one that already has them implemented, so that's what I used here. So Nom Supreme is a really fantastic library. I hope you check it out. Leave a comment with what you think about Nom Supreme and whether you would use it or not. I think it has some really interesting user experience improvements and especially the error tree is really nice for not having to build up your own error, especially when you're first building a parser to actually get that error information back when you haven't figured out even if your parser is working yet. So have a great rest of your day and I will see you in the next video.